Well, demand is through the roof. Uh, a lot of the AI startups in the U.S., a lot of the companies that are trying to roll it out are trying to cobble together enough compute across all the different cloud providers. They can't get it all from one. Uh, and this is typically the case. Uh, back when I was at Google, uh, back in the day, uh, when we would launch a new AI product, typically would require 10 to 20 times as much compute as it took to train it. Let's get Arjun. Jonathan, just want to jump in here and talk a little bit uh, about, of course, one of the big players in the space, NVIDIA. Um, they've been so entrenched in multiple fronts on the training uh, side, but they're also pushing into inferencing. They've been very strong with the CUDA software offering. So how do you differentiate from that play as it continues to push into the inferencing space? Well, NVIDIA's GPUs are amazing at training, and the software stack they've built is world-class for it. So they should continue working on that, and uh, that'll make the industry better. Um, one, we were actually one of the best things that's ever happened for NVIDIA shareholders. Uh, inference tends to be a lower margin business, higher volume but lower margin. And uh, NVIDIA can only build as many GPUs as they're planning to build this year because they use uh, very uh, exotic components like HBM and CoWAS and these other things that you probably haven't heard of. Um, we actually don't use any of that and so we're not as supply limited. And that's important for inference, which is very high volume, low margin. And the reason that we're so good for NVIDIA's shareholders is we're happy to take that high volume but lower margin business and let uh, others focus on the high margin training market. And in this, in this very low margin business, Jonathan, I've seen uh, just anecdotally startups popping up left, right and center saying that they are doing AI inferencing when it comes to chip. It seems like a very hot space uh, at this point in time. So again, this is a very competitive environment. Uh, do you expect a, a large number of players in this space in the future? Oh, absolutely. Whenever something becomes hot, you'll see hundreds of startups pop up. They'll get funded. Um, but building an AI chip is quite expensive. You're probably going to be spending anywhere from a quarter to a half a billion dollars to get that thing to market, and you can't fund everyone to do that. On top of that, uh, a lot of the approaches are very similar to GPUs, and they're not differentiated. The moment that you see external memory in an inference chip, you can already tell that it's not going to be competitive. You can't use NVIDIA's playbook um, if you're going to go after inference. They've already mastered it. Jonathan, let me just circle back to your identity, Grok, because Elon Musk has gone after a similar space in terms of the name. Even though there's a K instead of a Q, I mean, it sounds the same to us as humans, maybe not to the computers where it just uh, seems very similar. But uh, in, in terms of what we've got, uh, intuitive understanding, this is the, the very origins of your name, Grok. The lawyers have been over this. Do you think there's going to be any movement from Elon Musk's side around changing Grok's name as the AI chatbot? Well, I can't speak for Elon, but I'll say that um, everyone in kindergarten learns this concept of dibs, uh, and we've called dibs. You've called dibs. Okay, we'll see if Elon Musk is watching uh, and whether he, uh, whether he takes that to heart. Um, let me ask you, Jonathan, about uh, competition for talent. There's been stories swirling about how Meta has tried to poach some of OpenAI's top AI engineers in some cases for uh, almost a hundred million dollars so massive pay packages obviously that's for a select number of engineers but clearly it's emblematic of this race for uh, for, for talent in the industry what's your experience been in terms of uh, luring retaining talent what's it costing you and, and how easy is it to find a uh, key talent these days so I think in our case uh, we've had an easier time finding and retaining talent because uh, we're a little bit adjacent to the AI research space we're not creating the models, we're creating the chips. Um, that said, it is a hot market and there is a lot of pull for the best talent. Um, in our case, uh, I think a lot of people view us as having a very large growth trajectory if we're successful and they'd like to be on that path. So people join us largely for the equity and the growth potential. Mm. And, and you talk about the, the math, massive growth opportunity here. What are the main obstacles in the inferencing business when it comes to scaling? Well, typically it's the supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, Jensen himself said it at GTC, if you want to get, um, uh, you wanna get GPUs in two years, you have to put your POs in today. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge bet. I mean, do you know what's gonna happen in AI in 24 months? Okay. Any guesses? <laughs> we don't know what's happening tomorrow in like 24 months. <laughs> exactly, and so that's just a ridiculous requirement. And so for us, it's about six months, mm -hmm. which is a fourth of the time that totally changes your ability to make predictions on what you need. And part of that is because we don't have those exotic supply chain components, so we can build very quickly. In fact, the data center that we're here to talk about that um, we're building in Europe. So we decided about four weeks ago to build a data center in Helsinki, 
uh, and uh, we're actually uh, unloading racks into it right now, and we expect to be serving traffic starting by the end of this week. That's build fast. And so it's a very different proposition from what you see in the rest of the market. So you're talking about some sort of first mover advantage here. But down the track, is this part of the market just going to be completely commoditized? Because that's sort of the feeling that the very expensive, high-end part of the market was on the trading side. But when we get to the inferencing, the workhorse part of the market, then it's just going to be all commoditized. Do you agree with that? So the way to think about AI inference is a little bit like electricity. right? You plug your appliance into the wall, and you get electricity, and you don't think about it too much. Um, and that's true of AI and compute. Compute is the electricity for AI. However, if someone was able to produce electricity cheaper and more reliably, you wouldn't consider it commodity. And so that's what we're trying to do. Well, you just mentioned the energy side. What is the energy problem in Europe? Because it feels as though we're coming at it much more expensive, relying on some renewable aspects here. Do you see a, a competitive issue in terms of AI in Europe versus, say, the United States? You can play it smart. So for example, our chips use about a third of the energy per token produced versus a GPU. So with the same amount of energy, you can get three times as much compute, or you can get the same amount of compute with a third as much energy. The other benefit is um, because we're so much lower latency than a GPU, we, we produce the tokens faster. Uh, what that allows you to do is locate the compute further away. So from Helsinki, you're actually going to see performance that's better than having a GPU sitting right next to you anywhere in Europe. And so that means that you can locate the data centers where power is more plentiful, where it's less expensive, uh, and that is just a better strategy. And where real estate is cheaper too. Exactly.